if I can get it to progress. Uh, that's it. So I always start off with a bit of optimism. Um, and uh, this is a picture from about 12 years ago. I used to commute along the um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Manchester Road uh, corridor to Salford every day. Uh, and this is taken at the junction of Gladstone Road and Manchester Road in, um, in at Mousey's Gate. Um, that was a fairly typical experience at that junction. Uh, and it's good to see from the pictures that Tom has posted um, that uh, that this Cyclops Junction is actually uh, moving on now. Um, so that, that's great. That will actually reduce the, uh, the, the, the fear of that kind of thing happening again. But there's always a but when I do these optimistic things. But what about the road leading up to it? Because these are also pictures from the same period um, on the road leading up to it. So. I don't know if there are any plans for that because I've not seen them in any scheme yet. But um, but good uh, good good stuff on the uh, on the Gladstone Road Junction. Uh, a lot of interesting research and data, some of which is is new, some of which isn't so new. Um, I just want to start with uh, with this one, um, an Arab report funded by Sustrans on inclusive cycling, and that sort of came up for me because we talked quite a lot about that lately with the uh, the issue of barriers. Uh, and Neil has uh, drawn attention to people with uh, uh, with uh, hearing impairments in the um, activation work that he's been doing. But of course, we need to our inclusivity needs to cover all types of diversity, and it needs to be done properly. Uh, and this guide is is really good, and uh, so please do read it. Um, it's actually four years old. It was in 2020. Um, but it's a, it's a great guide on how to do it, not just in the technical sense, but in, in all aspects of how to, to make this stuff work. So that's really worth doing. And also, uh, there's a foreword by uh, Dame Sarah Storey, uh, which is there. It was actually, obviously, when she was the uh, Active Travel Commissioner for Sheffield. Um, but uh, you can read that again. But, it, but you know, just to, to, to stress that this is very close to, uh, to Dame Sarah's heart. Uh, there's another um, thing that uh, has been out recently. I mentioned um, when we talked about the Rothwell Street uh, barriers, Wheels for Wellbeing, who are really probably the leaders, the leading charity in this space. Uh, and this is stuff that they've just recently been posting on Twixter, um, which is uh, X, the thing that used to be known as Twitter. Um, and they said, is it really more difficult to create accessible pavement, cycle lanes and crossings and safe streets than it is to build motorways? It's, it seems like that when you try and do it. Um, they said, we don't think so. It's political will, prioritisation and, and funding uh, will hopefully address that. So a lot of stuff going on on inclusivity. Um, second one, there's a new book out soon. It's not out yet, but uh, Laura Laker is absolutely great. And she, her, um, her articles in um, newspapers and so on uh, on active travel uh, are really good. This book promises to be very good. And the people who have seen pre, uh, who've had a, a preview of it uh, seem to like it. And that's just a quote from Chris Boardman and that. So have a look out for that one because, uh, again, it's one that covers all aspects. And these, this is the table of contents. So I've not read it yet because I don't have the luxury of uh, advanced access, but uh, but it, it, it covers a lot of the politics and stuff like that, which I think is important. Uh, next one, Active Lives Adults, Adults Survey came out on the 18th of April um, and uh, that was published by Sport England. I think I was going to put another bullet point in there, but I ran out of time. Uh, so, um, so uh, please have a look at that. A couple of things from it. Uh, one is that uh, the good news that um, active travel, uh, which is the green line uh, in the middle there between fitness activities and walking for leisure, uh, is now sort of approaching the level it was prior to the COVID um, crisis. Uh, so that's good news in the sense that, it, that, that, that from 2020, it's actually uh, bouncing back now. But if you look at Bolton, one of the things that's in there is the latest figures on uh, physical adult physical activity. And if you remember, uh, an adult is considered to be physically inactive if they don't get more than half an hour's moderate exercise per week. So these are people that do get more than half an hour's mod moderate exercise a week. Um, Bolton, again, it's bouncing back, um, but not very much. And compared to the national average, it's, uh, it's still pretty poor. Um, so in, in relation to um, to active lives, this is, you know, this is really important stuff for Bolton. 
Uh, next one is um, one that came out uh, a couple of months ago. It was after the last meeting, uh, but it's a, a brilliant report by an organisation called Create Streets, funded by Cycling UK, but it's actually about all modes. And it's ab an absolutely fantastic resource. It came out in the middle of March. Um, so please go and have a look at that because it's uh, it, it's got so much information, infographics, case studies, uh, everything you need to support any active travel uh, scheme proposal. Um, if you click on the, like all of these, if you click on the picture, it'll take you to the uh, to the report itself. Um, that takes you to a page with a sort of page turner app, which is, an, is a nightmare because it's so slow. But at the bottom of that app, there is a link to download the PDF. So that's the thing to do. It's about 64 pages long, but it's um, it's that is actually quite concise considering the, the amount of stuff that's packed into it. Uh, one of the things I've just picked out from that is, uh, which is again an answer to all of the naysayers, um, is uh, research that was done uh, in 2023 by YouGov showing that across all um, political sides and um, basically everyone, uh, the support for active travel is massive. And so when people tell you that, uh, oh, this is that this was actually about the 15-minute neighbourhood, which is low traffic neighborhoods, the ability to walk and cycle uh, any, to, to, the, to your services and shops and so on uh, within 15 minutes. Um, contrary to what, uh, what some politicians would tell us, uh, is actually very popular. Okay, so coming on to what some people would tell us, I want to say a little bit about the, uh, what's happening in government, some of which we've looked at before, but there are new developments, but some of which is actually an outcome of the, um, uh, the, the recent election. Uh, and reinforces what was in the previous slide. So the net zero plan, this is the government's plan to, uh, to bring the UK um, carbon output to zero net. So you produce, you're uh, taking in as much carbon as your, your carbon dioxide as you're putting out. Um, for the second time that the High Court has ruled the, um, the plan unlawful. Um, so the first time was in 2022. Um, it was considered so inadequate it was unlawful. 2024, um, the carbon budget delivery plan, which is part of the response to that 2022 uh, decision, uh, has also been uh, uh, been declared unlawful by the High Court. Uh, and this uh, this work, this legal work, is being done by the Good Law Project, Friends of the Earth, and Client Earth. Um, so the government really isn't doing very well on all of this. And if you look at that assessment of risks, um, one particular line is related to active travel. And what the, the government have said uh, about that is that there is a high annual investment in cycling and walking infrastructure and policy. They list a whole lot of things, the cycling walking investment strategy and so on. Um, and then they talk about the risks being local authorities not uh, having the capacity to, to, to do it uh, and perhaps even resisting doing it. And the mitigations Active Travel England has been established and, and yeah, that's good stuff. But the government remains committed to investing in active travel with about three billion pounds committed up to 2025. Now, this uh, statement was um, was just over a year ago, um, but uh, a year ago, the DFT's budget for cycling and walking was cut by more than 50 percent last March, uh, March of last year, 2023. And in October 2023, the, the uh, Public Accounts Committee produced a report that said the DFT has made little progress against its objectives to increase active travel. And at the same time as all of that, uh, we had um, uh, the, uh, the, the government doing other things and the Prime Minister making announcements back in October and November. Uh, we'll come back to that. So the Transport Action Network have launched a legal challenge and they were approved to, um, uh, to, to have a full hearing in the, uh, in the court, a judicial review, um, about the active travel cuts that were uh, put in place just over a year ago. Um, with judicial reviews, you can't actually um, sort of use a judicial review to complain about the substance of what's been done, but you can complain about the way it's been done and the failure to take account of the factors that should have been taken into account, the failure to uh, follow your own policies and procedures uh, and that sort of thing. And um, it looks as though, uh, from the uh, information that was brought to the court, um, the DFT actually panicked and uh, and cut that budget because the Treasury and uh, 10 Downing Street said you've got to cut more out of this and you're not going to touch uh, motor vehicles. So that seems to be the picture. Um, the hearing was held on the 30th of April and we're still waiting for the decision. That 
generally takes about three weeks apparently. I just remember reminding um, people of what um, of a slide that I had in my November uh, update uh, when the uh, the Prime Minister had just announced that the war on the motorists was going to be stopped. Um, and the uh, result of that was that the, um, the uh, statutory guidance that DFT issued uh, just around the time of COVID on uh, reallocation, uh, reallocation of road space and things like the requirement to consult on schemes and so on uh, was scrapped and replaced by a thing with a thing called the plan for drivers. So what's happened on oh, uh, in relation to that, to all that sort of conspiracy theory stuff, Jesse Norman, who used to be the transport, one of the transport ministers, under Secretary of State for, for Transport, um, he has recently said uh, that leaders at all levels should address often ungrounded public worries about such things as 15 minute cities and the so-called war on drivers, basically conspiracy theories. Uh, the British government won't, refuses to recognise and support the health benefits of cycling. Uh, and he says that we need a significantly more serious, vigorous, joined up and long term strategy for cycling. And the reason he is no longer the, um, the minister is because he resigned, um, I think, as a reaction to the announcement that the DFT and the prime minister uh, made at the, at the time back in uh, October. So that's what a former minister thinks. What does the public think? Well, um, the London mayor election is actually a very good case to case study to look at that. Um, that's actually a tweet from Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who is famous for having turned things around in New York and who wrote the book Street Fight, which I've talked about before uh, in the forum. Um, he actually won uh, the election when a lot of people thought he was going to lose. Now, if we look at the campaign that the Conservative candidate, who's came second, uh, this is a load of her tweets, which I've just taken today from uh, from Twitter. And you can see what the, the, the message has been, that all this stuff about low traffic neighbourhoods and cycle lanes and uh, uh, in particular the ULES, U, the um, ultra low emission zone expansion, uh, I will overturn that on day one. Uh, so that's been her the basis on which she's fought the uh, fought the election. Um, I did a little analysis of the results from that mayoral election, and uh, unfortunately, the electoral system has changed. They've gone from uh, quite a good uh, single transferable vote approach to a first past the post approach this time, um, and that's I think that's a backward step. It's not. It's not a very dem democratic step to take because uh, single transferable vote is far superior to FTPT, uh, FPTP um, for, uh, for, for getting results. But if you look at it, uh, in the first round of the 2021 uh, election, those were the figures. So Labour, uh, sorry, those were the figures. So Labour had a, a significant lead of uh, Conservative and then there were Greens and Lib Dems. What then happens under that, that system is the people who st still have a chance of winning if the other people's votes were redistributed uh, carry on to the second round and the others are eliminated. And so you get transfers of votes from this group and a number of independents and so on to these candidates and there were only two candidates in that second round uh, and that's what the picture looked like on the second round in 2021. So that makes the figures difficult to compare. So what I've done is I've said well let's assume that the transfers will be in the same proportions as they were in 2021. Not necessarily a, a valid assumption but it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable one. Um, so the transfers then were 69% and 31% uh, 69% transfer from Green and Lib Dem to Labour, 31% transfer from Green and Lib Dem to Conservative. Uh, and so when you when you apply the same proportions to this year's, then you can see that the um, uh, the share of the um, of the vote, that Sadiq Khan's share of the vote has gone up since 2021. So all of his stuff on putting cycle lanes in, um, uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, uh, ultra low emission zones, all of these things that, uh, that the loud, noisy people say are terrible uh, and everybody hates them. Well, it seems that actually perhaps people don't hate them quite so much because they voted him in again with a bigger majority. Um, I'll just remind you that I told you this in 2020 and uh, just to plug, I, I, I look back at that, uh, um, that talk that I did in the August meeting of, uh, sorry, in the July meeting of the Active Travel Forum and um, just watching it back through, 
if I were to do that talk again, I would give exactly the same talk four years later. I wouldn't change anything. So uh, if anyone hasn't seen that and wasn't here at that time, uh, you can actually go and look at it there because I presented it again on Ideas with Beers. Uh, so there's a link there. The slideshow you can get there. And we also had a workshop and um, there was a, a slideshow for the workshop there. So, you know, this stuff, I think, is quite important to, to look back at. Uh, basically, that's one of the slides there, which is, is quoting experience from other projects that said, yeah, lots of people were shouting, but they were actually a tiny minority. Uh, most people were just silent and either didn't care or they were in favour of the changes. And just going back to that Move Free report, the conclusion in that report says to uh, to councils, to look to highways authorities, don't hate cars, don't war wage a war against motorists because nobody's doing that. Uh, but don't wage a war for them either. Don't emphasise motoring over other modes. Instead, fight the battle for place and for happy and healthy, prosperous and productive neighbourhoods. All the evidence suggests that the voters will thank you. So if we could have a lovely green uh, walking and cycling route um, and place with benches and trees and places to, uh, to just stand and chat uh, on Manchester Road, that will be fantastic. And the voters will thank you for it. Uh, not much to say on what other councils are doing, because I because I said a lot last time. But just to come back to Paris, just to um, to emphasise, um, there was a new um, something something new came out about this uh, recently. So I've just put this back in, um, just to give a little bit of the history. The Plan Vélo, which was it was launched in 2015 when Mayor Anne Hidalgo um, had shortly had recently taken power. Uh, which is just two years before the Greater Manchester Made to Move strategy was published, just two years. Um, in 2024, they have now more people cycling than driving in Paris, um, especially in the centre, but actually also in the suburbs. And rush hour commuting, 18.9% of trips are made by bike, only 6.6% are made by car, the rest are public transport and walking. Um, and they did things in the way that I've described, COVID corona pieces, they called them, temporary um, uh, cycling infrastructure, um, which then were made permanent. And it's happened so fast um, that the, the, the changes, I mean, most of the changes have been very recently in the last four or five years, uh, and they've reached that point. Greater Manchester will not reach anything like that point in two years time. Uh, finally, on engagement, uh, yes, we're still doing this, even though we don't get that many numbers, although we actually got into double figures in April, which is uh, is promising. Uh, we saw some new faces, so hopefully we'll see even more new faces. OK, now that's the end of that. I've got some more slides which are actually for any other business, so I'll stop sharing at that point. OK, thank you, Graham. Does anybody have any questions for Graham on that presentation? Dave? I uh, was just going to note that, um, uh, that Andy Street, who was the uh, the mayor of, of, of the West Midlands, uh, he, although, he's, as you mentioned, Susan Hall in, in London and the Conservative mayor or candidate in Great Manchester campaign on, on, a, on, a, on, on that, on that Ending the war on a motorist, scrap the cycle lanes manifesto. Andy Street, um, the opposite. Uh, he was a conservative mayor in the West Midlands. He campaigned to double uh, investment in active travel if he was if he was re-elected. He was he wasn't, uh, uh, but he was perhaps. You know, it, ben Hoochin was, was 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 retained as conservative mayor in Teesside, and Andy Street was a close. It went to a recount, didn't it, uh, in the in the in the West Midlands. So um, yeah, active travel is not necessarily a party political thing. Most of the things that, that, that Rishi Sunak has, and his government has been opposed to were things that were brought in by his predecessor. Um, you know, the, the Boris Johnson's perhaps been the, the biggest supporter of act to travel of any prime minister we've had of, of any of any party. So act to travel isn't necessarily a party political thing, even though it might feel like it at the moment. Um, and yeah, act to travel is broadly popular across the political agenda. Uh, there was the DFT commission a study into the controversy of low traffic neighbourhoods. The one in Wigan was included in the survey and that uh, identified that most people in the low traffic neighbourhood didn't know that they lived in the low traffic neighbourhood and didn't care. And other people who did know and did care, about two thirds were supportive and one third were opposed. Obviously, that third were vehemently opposed and very loud and very noisy because um, they really hated it. But most people didn't know, didn't care. 
Uh, most people like that. I've remained it. Most people, most of them liked it. So yes, there you go. Yeah, thanks. I just just to stress that I, my my point was more about um, people who campaign on the anti-active travel ticket mm. tend not yeah, to do well, rather than it being they could do badly. Yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. they all mm. did badly. All, all the people who campaign on active travel ticket, uh, regardless of party, did badly. OK, thank you. Any more questions to Graham on that presentation? No, OK, thank you very much for that, Graham. Um, if I can quickly move us on then to item eight, and there is the schedule of uh, 2024 meetings within the agenda. Um, I will just flag up that I will, uh, as soon as we have the uh, uh, committee schedule released. I will just double check that there's no conflicts there and uh, look to confirm those dates within the minutes. Um, we have the opportunity to talk about workshops and obviously uh, noting time pressures, but we did mention earlier about the possibility of looking at a uh, reviewing the B network map at a future workshop. Is that something that uh, people would appreciate on the meeting to do? Yeah, yeah, I'm getting quite a few nods. Um, Graham, can I work with yourself to see if we can try and get yeah. a date in the diary? I suspect yeah. that is going to be a face-to-face -face meeting around the table, not a Teams meeting. Yeah, yeah that would be Perfect. best. Right, well, action point for ourselves uh, to have something in place and uh, I will circulate a date as soon as uh, we've got one scheduled. Uh, thank you. So can I bring us on to any other business and uh, Graham? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I have something. Can I just share a screen because it's I can do things quicker if I've got some some way of showing them on the screen. So what I what I want to propose is that um, is that we try and we put in some some kind of activity to identify low low cost interventions um, and um, get those somehow into the system because there are lots of things that we discuss privately. Uh, so, for example, when we go on the critical mass, we have uh, lots of discussions in the pub afterwards uh, and that sort of thing uh, that never really get into the system. And I think it'd be nice to, to do that. And some of them are really cheap. Some of them are uh, not quite so cheap, but I would still describe them as low cost. And so. Come on, if this will. Just a moment. There we are. So first one is um, school streets. We need to do more of that. And I really put this picture in for Neil because Neil mentioned that Chadwick Street is an absolute nightmare at, um, at uh, school start and finish times. Well, this is Ashworth Lane in um, at Bank Top at school start and finish times. And, um, you know, I think people are going to get killed if uh, if it carries on like this. Um, so we need to do something about it. Um, Crossings, yes, um, you've included crossings, and I think that's great, but uh, but more emphasis on crossings. And as Shan suggested, a way of people feeding into the system, um, a, a possible uh, crossing uh, developments. Barrier removal, we've talked about, but I think that is a relatively low cost intervention. Um, the cost is more of a political one, just getting past the... Um, uh, the belief that um, that antisocial behaviour is more important than people's uh, ability to get around without getting run over. Um, but um, sorry, I was a bit uh, harsh there in my characterisation, but that's that's what it comes down to. Uh, parking restrictions, and I'll come back to that. Um, junction improvements, I will also come back to, and contraflow cycling, I'll come back to because I've got some some uh, more pictures to look at that. Parking. This is Chorley New Road. Um, that's me going past a parked car. Uh, the car to my right was doing probably in excess of 40 miles per hour. That is not acceptable. Uh, he wasn't breaking the speed limit. He was doing probably actually he was probably doing about 40 miles per hour, which is the speed limit. The fact that I have to come out into there, uh, the driver who was quite a way behind when I moved out, uh, but just plowed on through regardless uh, and passed far too close. 
this is the sort of thing we're talking about when we're talking about parking restrictions on trolling your own. That's one example, but we need to have uh, examples of this all over the borough. You know, where is parking causing a, a safety problem for people on bicycles? And also, if you look on the left hand side, I'm not sure I'd be able to get past with uh, my grandchildren's double buggy in the, on that pavement, uh, just as I wasn't able to get past these when I was out on a couple of my uh, my walks trying to get the, uh, the two boys to sleep. This is what we face all the time. And believe me, going out into a, into a road with a double buggy like that is not fun. So, you know, this needs to be dealt with somehow. Um, it might not be low cost, but uh, but maybe there are particular places where uh, where we need to pay attention to it. The one on the right, for example, that is always like that. That road is always like that. That's Ramsey Street, and it's not in Australia. This one, it's in Astley Bridge. Um, junctions. Now, um, yes, these are a bit more expensive to deal with, but we have some junctions that are over and over again uh, involved in near misses. This is a near miss that I experienced at the Blackburn Road, Belmont Road junction. Um, that's the geometry of the junction. I was coming from the right there, um, along there. Uh, I was going straight ahead. The driver of that car came up the outside and then just cut across. And if I hadn't uh, been very quick and braked and swerved, I would have been hit. That's probably 30 miles an hour plus. Now, people don't have to slow down to take this, this turn. And this is a, just a classic case of a, of a dangerous junction design. What we need is something like that. And, you know, it's I don't know how much the cost is, but I think that can be done relatively cheaply uh, with rubber bolt down curbs and um, and so on. I know there are issues of drainage and, and that sort of thing that not have to be considered. But, um, you know, people will get killed if we don't deal with them. And there, so I think there are certain places in the borough where a specific spot intervention could actually make a big difference uh, and make it safer and certainly make it feel safer. Finally, contraflow cycling. One of the problems that um, that we, we find when we're cycling around, if we're trying to stay off the busy roads, is one way streets. And a lot of the time we just cycle the wrong way down, down them because it's a lot safer than going on the road. Uh, but of course, the fact that it's illegal introduces a chilling effect, which uh, means a lot of people actually don't bother to try and uh, keep themselves safe uh, because they don't want to break the law and get uh, prosecuted. Um, so I started some time ago to build um, a, a map of examples of uh, one way streets where contraflow cycling could be uh, possible and would be extremely beneficial. Uh, so if we take that one, for example, there's one, uh, the, the fourth one from the top, uh, which is just to the right of the words as the Bolton Superstore. Uh, that is a road that goes from Astley Bridge Junction up eventually through to Ashworth Lane. That is a route that is, if you're going to use the cycleways on the junction, poor as they are, then actually using that route to get to it is, is a very good choice. But it's a one way street. It's illegal to cycle down there. Uh, and the, it's such a quiet street. There is no way, uh, no reason why that should be that uh, one way. And so I've started to make a picture of all of them, some in the town centre, um, I mean, one of the problems we have on Bolton Critical Mass is when we're deciding which way to go, uh, it's quite hard because there are so many one way streets getting in the way uh, that are so quiet. It would not be any hardship to allow people to cycle. Benefits um, increases permeability of cycling, allows quiet routes and cut throughs to be used, which have been shown to be safer than using main roads, even though you're cycling against the, uh, the, the one way flow of traffic of uh, notional one way flow of traffic. They provide safer access to, to facilities like the, um, the Astley Bridge cycleways. Um, they reduce footway cycling because people don't have to cycle on the footways anymore uh, because they've got quiet routes where it's legal to, uh, to, to cycle. They're already widespread in many places, particularly in Europe, and it doesn't cost very much. I mean, you might have to do, you could probably do a blanket tra traffic regulation order for the whole of Bolton to do a vast number of these. Um, and um, here are some references. There's an article uh, from Cycling UK about that. And the, there's a, a very good paper from the European Transport Safety Council uh, about the, the pros and cons of, uh, of doing this. So if you click that image, you'll go to the map that I started creating. I started creating it about a year ago and then I forgot I was doing it. 
Um, but uh, but there it is. Also in LTN one stroke twenty, there's information about contraflow cycling uh, in that section, section six point four twenty one to twenty four. Okay, so oh, I'll skip that one because it's not very friendly. Um, that's my proposal. <laughs> a register of low cost and relatively low cost interventions that could actually be jumped on and uh, and made something of whenever a bit of um, uh, a bit of uh, money comes along 